Do you want to start sailing now? Not when you retire or when you could afford that perfect blue water sailboat. The first principle in Lynn and Larry Pardee's cruising philosophy is go small, go simple, go now. So we're going to show you our favourite small sailboats for under £10,000. Remember, a small sailboat can take you big places. So small yachts can be affordable, simple and seaworthy, but yet you won't see lots of them in today's cruising grounds. Today's anchorages are full of 40 foot, 50 foot and 60 foot sailing yachts. But that's not to say you can't sail around the world on one of these small boats. They do have some caveats, one of those being speed. So generally the smaller the boat, the slower it will be going through the water. Now the time to take this into consideration is when you're on longer passages because this means you're more vulnerable to changes in the weather if you're doing one week, two week or three week passages. If you're still coastal cruising then this isn't too much of an issue because you can always just nip into a harbour that's close by. Now living on a sailboat can be challenging because of the space. Now if you say living on a small boat that can be even more challenging. But as long as you're aware of what you're getting yourself into and you've been on a couple of these boats, if you're the minimalist and you have that minimalist inside you, then you will enjoy this adventure nonetheless. But one thing you have to be careful to account for is crew. Obviously the smaller the boat, the less people you're going to be able to have on the boat. So you'll be doing longer shifts or you'll be having less rests than you would if you had a larger boat with more crew. Now it's not just the living space that can be slightly more uncomfortable, it's also the sailing that can be more uncomfortable too. Being a smaller boat you're going to be more vulnerable to the larger seas and you will find that you move around a little bit more while sailing. Now having got those points out of the way, it should be a huge factor that these boats are more affordable. You're going to get on the water a lot faster and things will be much cheaper to repair if they break along the way, let alone that you'll be able to fit into most marinas and the price tag will be a little bit less than those 40 footers that you see in the marina. One of the great things about small boats is that you're also less likely to spend so much time fixing them. Because they're so small they have less complicated systems. For example, most small boats don't have showers, electric windlasses, water makers or even hot water for that matter. So though they may be less convenient, this can save you time and money to get you on the water faster and also sailing further. Now what sort of small sailboat list would this be without introducing the Albin Vaga 27 first? So the Albin Vaga has earned the reputation as a blue water cruiser through the adventurous sailors such as Matt Rutherford. He completed a 309 day solo sail of the Americas in one of these small capable boats, solidifying its presence in the adventurous capable small boat category. Now like so many of the seaworthy sailboats that are sailing around the globe, the Albin Vaga was created in Sweden in 1964. There are currently over 3000 Albin Vagas that are still floating around the world and these had a manufacturing run that lasted over 10 years. The designer when creating the Albin Vaga set out to create something that was affordable, quick, roomy, seaworthy and light. Which I'm sure that every manufacturer aims for but obviously there is always some considerations and sacrifices that have to be made especially for a boat that is this size. For example with sailboats something that is seaworthy generally isn't fast and something that is a performance sailboat generally isn't as seaworthy as something that's heavier. But the Vega is somewhat of an exception. It seems to exceed well in kind of both of these areas. Now there is clearly some space lacking below compared to some contemporary designs. It's the Vega's narrow beam of exactly eight foot that makes it quite cozy down below. But on the flip side, contemporary designs purposefully forego seaworthiness for a more spacious interior. Vega has a somewhat firm bilge and a shallow hull. Even though a keel is long, it only extends for about half the length of the waterline. While the length is more than adequate for good tracking, particularly downwind in the trades, this keel's reduced surface area and hence less friction aids the Vega's performance in light winds. The accommodation layer is logical for a boat with a waterline of 23 feet, beginning with a chain locker up front, followed by a V-berth and a toilet just forward of the gangway which can be closed off from the main cabin but remains open for the V-berth. 
The galley is divided into two sections at the back end of the cabin. There is also no dedicated chart table as is typical in a boat of this size. The Vegas rig is entirely conventional and simple to operate. This masthead sloop has a single spreader and two lower shrouds on each side. The mast and boom are aluminium and neither are overly large but the mast is stepped on the deck which can cause problems in the long run, compressing the deck and causing damage over the years. Okay, so now let's have a look at some of the technical information. So the first thing we're gonna look at is the displacement. Now generally speaking, a heavy displacement tends to give a more comfortable ride in rough seas as the yacht tends to go through the tops of the waves rather than over them. On the other hand, a light displacement hull has less wetted surface area hence less drag and better acceleration. The Vega comes in at about 186, making this a light displacement boat on the upper end. So of all of the boats on this list, this will be the lightest one. But one thing to keep in mind is with any of these statistics is they don't give an exact or true idea of how these boats sail, but just a general consensus. The next detail we're gonna look at is the sail area to displacement ratio. This is a way of working out how well powered a vessel is by her sail area. About 15 to 18 is ideal for ocean cruising. Boats with around 12 and below can be considered underpowered and motor sailors. Now the Vega has a sail area displacement ratio of 16.09, making it one of the sportier boats on this list. So we're gonna have a look at the comfort ratio next. This provides a reasonable comparison between yachts of a similar size and type. This predicts the speed of the upward and downward motion of the boat as it encounters waves and swell. The faster the motion, the more uncomfortable the passengers may be. Numbers below 20 indicate a lightweight racing boat, whereas 20 to 30 indicates a coastal cruiser and 30 to 40 indicates a moderate blue water cruising boat. Although these numbers should also be taken with a little bit of a pinch of salt. The Vega comes in with a comfort ratio of 20 which is one of the lowest that we have on our list. So any way you cut it, the Albin Vega represents great value for an ocean going vessel for a minimal investment. Now the next boat doesn't need any introductions. It's one of the most popular British built boats. It's the Westerly Centaur, which is a 26 foot pocket cruiser. Westerly were possibly Europe's top production builder of fiberglass composite boats from the middle of the 60s through to the 70s. Westerly saw a demand for a compact cruiser with an accommodation that was comparable to the degree of comfort found on larger boats. To create the design, they hired a renowned company, L. Giles and Partners. This partnership produced the Centaur, a vessel whose popularity led to the production of more than 2,500 hulls, of which many were imported to the United States. Older boats are generally sound and have held up well. However, the bilge keel attachments, the forward bulkhead attachment, and the attachment of the rigging shroud chain plates are among places to inspect for problems. Although a few Centaurs have had outboard motors, the majority were equipped with different Volvo Marine inboard diesel engines, with a horsepower rate in ranging between 7 and 25 horsepower. Although 25 horsepower may seem like a lot for a 2.7 ton boat, keep in mind that this design was made for the UK market where strong tidal currents are a regularity, and too much power is more preferred than too little. So it's no secret with a Westerly Centaur that these little pocket cruisers are quite capable. They can literally be found all over the Mediterranean and also over in the Americas. Even though this design has been around for more than 30 years, there aren't many 26 foot boats that can compare to the Centaur's space. So now if we look at the statistics for the Centaur, one thing that really stands out is that it has a displacement to length ratio of 308.22 which if you look at the comfort ratio, which it has of 26.66, kind of makes sense. The heavier the boat, the more comfortable it is to sail. So just to give you some ideas, a light displacement is around 100 to 200, and most coastal cruising yachts have a moderate displacement of two to 300. Now a heavy displacement is anything above 300. In older, heavier cruising boats, the sail area displacement number was almost always below 16, and often as low as 12. These boats need 12 to 15 knots of wind to get going. Now the sail area displacement number is significantly affected by adding weight to the boat and by how the sail area itself is measured. Now because we're planning on using these boats for cruising, 
These numbers should be taken with a pinch of salt as we'll be adding quite a bit of weight if we're planning on going any long distance. When we was looking to buy a boat, we noticed that these boats are affordable. You get great space on the inside and they are quite desirable for a couple looking to go traveling at a slower pace, giving that more luxury room on the inside, especially for a 26 foot boat. So the next boat we have on this list is a British built Hunter Horizon 27. In an effort to bring more cruiser orientated yachts to the market, the Horizon range was introduced. The Hunter Horizon 27 was launched in 1989. One year later in 1990, the boat was renamed the 272 and later again became the 273. Interestingly, in 2009, it became a brand of Lauren Marine of Southampton under the name British Hunter, the exact boatyard where we bought Talisman. Hunter boats have always been well known for having deep, efficient twin keels. In fact, they now call them twin fins instead of bilge keels. The bilge keels are a popular trait of British boats, and this is due to the tidal waters. One thing that you might actually find with a bilge keel boat as well is that they're cheaper to moor, because as they can dry out, it limits access to the boats. Although a lot of people in England don't tend to find this a problem. With a fractional rig and a self-tacking jib, plus all sail controls including reefing lines led back to the cockpit, the Horizon is an easy boat to handle, making it another good choice for solo sailors and couples. Looking inside, the saloon has one berth on a raised platform forward, but this is small and probably more for children. There are also two settee berths and a galley to starboard with a heads compartment to port. Aft, there is a double berth, but some couples will likely find the aft cabin a strange shape to sleep in. That being said, I do like the layout, which is actually really impressive for a 27 foot boat. It has a much more modern look compared to some of the other small boats you find at this price point. The Horizon also has the added benefit of a proper nav table, which the smaller boats usually seem to lack. Again, a nice plus for a boat at this price. I see this boat as a brilliant starter boat that is more than capable of taking its owners further than they would think. Many owners are known to take them across the North Sea to Norway or across the Channel to France. Now neither of these are easy simple areas to sail, with the shallow seas that can build up nasty chop and fast running tides. The Hunter has a displacement to length ratio of 221.67. This puts it in the category of a moderate displacement ratio but also it has a sail area displacement of 16.17, which makes it the highest powered vessel we have on this list. Now, if we look at the comfort ratio, it has a comfort ratio of 17.44, which is the lowest on this list. These are nice sailors with modernish looks that are fun to sail and for the price are definitely worth a look. So now this next boat has three keel choices and it's also a favorite boat of mine. It's the Sadler 29. David Sadler, designer of the legendary Contessa 32, built around 400 Sadler 29s between 1981 and 1988. The Sadler 29 was the oldest designed to take part in Yachting World's Mini Rally in April 1988. She was liked for a classical appearance, tough build and obvious cruising ability. The Sadler seemed to get the balance between comfort and performance right. There is a spacious accommodation with a good galley, chart table and a cosy quarter berth. On top of this, the inner mouldings conceal enough foam buoyancy to make the boat float and sail if flooded. This is also said to reduce condensation compared to other boats. The 29 also has a deep, well-protected cockpit and a rig which again is easy to manage for short-handed crews. The rudder is transom hung and fully skegged, which offers protection to the rudder blade, improves tracking and helps lessen steering loads on the tiller. Sadler kept in mind that a boat needs to be able to withstand the kinds of weather that her crew might not necessarily prefer to go sailing in. And we feel that they've lived up to this expectation extremely well. So looking at the Sadler's statistics, the Sadler has a displacement to length ratio of a 307, which is actually very close to the Centaurs, putting it in the heavy displacement category. And again, looking at the sail area displacement ratio, it's very similar to the Centaur with its being 14.68. With a comfort ratio of 25.78, it would be considered a coastal cruiser, but we also know that this is still a very capable boat. Now, there are so many things that we like about this boat. 
but it has a lot of similarities to the next boat that we're going to be showing you. What would this list be without including our very own Talisman, a Stag 28? We're just going to go through some of the reasons that this boat stood out to us so much from the get-go. You are instantly greeted with an extremely spacious interior. The headroom pretty much throughout is around 6 foot 3 to 6 foot 4. And with a beam of three meters, you can see that it's got loads of storage in either side as well. Now this boat came with two different types of keel options, the most popular being a lifting keel. Now the keel that we actually went for was the fixed keel. And the reason for this is for the slightly better performance going offshore and tackling slightly longer crossings. The Stag 28 was designed by Peter Milne. Built at Emsworth Shipyard, it has a reputation as a robust and seaworthy cruising vessel with strength and safety at the forefront of the design. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail about this boat too much because obviously you can watch all our videos on this channel and also the boat tour which is here. Now obviously we think this is a great choice as a pocket cruiser, but unfortunately as there wasn't actually that many made, you might find it a bit difficult to find some on the market. Looking at the stag statistics, it has a moderate displacement of 223. The sail area displacement for the stag comes in at 11.94, which we actually found surprisingly low considering how we've sailed this boat. But there's one thing to keep in mind with the sail area displacement ratio. It's traditionally and still often calculated using the area of the mainsail and the area of the fore triangle, regardless of the type of headsail. Now the stag's comfort ratio is in the middle of this list with a comfort ratio of 21.51. The bottom line is that there's no substitute for real experience. So use these specs and ratios to create a short list, but then see if you can actually get on the boats as crew just to get a true real world experience of what you think they're going to be like. But if you're brand new to sailing, the minor differences in all of these boats probably won't mean anything to you at first, as it didn't with us when we first started. Best advice I can give is to meet someone who owns these boats and ask them the questions that you're eager to know and to see how these boats are performing. And a great resource to find information is on Yachting and Boating World. We sailed from the UK across the Bay of Biscay to the coast of Spain and then down the Atlantic coast of Europe into the Mediterranean and then cruised across the beautiful islands of the Balearics, eventually ending our season in the south of Italy. This for us gives credit to how capable pocket cruisers can be. Now whilst technically none of these boats on the list are blue water cruisers, what they do represent is a time when boats were built extremely well and made solid. With the right preparation, the right tactics, these boats definitely can take people on some long distance adventures. But as with all things safety, there must be considerations made. Now out of these boats that we've included in this video, they are all boats that we actually went aboard and we have seen ourselves from when we was looking for a boat before we actually purchased Talisman. With boats at this age and price range, there will be some work involved at the start. It's important that you either hire someone to do a survey for you or you feel competent enough to check the boat over yourself and try and find any serious issues. There are owners groups and owners associations which you can also check out to find out if there's any reoccurring problems with any of these boats. Most of the work that we've found is involved with a boat at this age and price as well. It's usually updating systems. It might just sometimes be a cosmetic thing or sometimes you might just want some new electronics as the ones on it are already looking a little bit tired. You'll be able to find more information on costs and examples of this in this video where we brought Talisman. As always, it's important to find the boat that suits you. A bilge keel might be more suitable to tidal waters like in Northern Europe and the UK, but if you plan on going on maybe some larger crossings, the fin keel choice might be what you prefer yourself. If you're planning to live aboard, you might find that it's the interior space that's more important than the seaworthiness. But either way, I'm sure there's a small boat at this price range that's going to suit you. Now I hope that you found some value in this video and you've learned something new. If there's anything you would like to add or you think that's important to mention, put it down in the comments and then everyone can see it as well. If you've enjoyed this video, please hit the like button and if it's your first time here, consider subscribing and maybe checking out some of our other videos. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.